what our common esophageal disorders, SLPs, might encounter. When people think of swallowing, they might just think about the throat and airway. While our big goal as medical SLPs is to help people protect their airway during mealtimes, it's easy to ignore the esophagus or think it's out of our scope of practice. But is it? It absolutely is within our scope of practice. The entire swallowing continuum comprises of the oral phase, pharyngeal phase, and esophageal phase. And SLPs will encounter esophageal impairments quite often if they serve the dysphagia population. I'm going to dive into common esophageal disorders SLPs encounter and what we can do about it. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Probably the most common esophageal disease you'll encounter both in life and as an SLP is gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. GERD currently affects up to 20% of the adult population in the US. While this disease is oftentimes referred to as heartburn, it should be known that GERD doesn't always cause a burning sensation. So what is GERD? This is a condition that occurs when contents from your stomach or gastric contents flow back up into the esophagus. This is known as retrograde flow. Symptoms may include the classic burning sensation in the chest, regurgitation, especially while lying down, and even difficulty with swallowing. People with GERD might even describe a lump in their throat, known as globus sensation. While SLPs can't diagnose GERD, it's important that we recognize the symptoms, collaborate with the interprofessional medical team, and know our roles when it comes to reducing symptoms and preventing or mitigating dysphagia. If left untreated, GERD can lead to esophageal strictures or even Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition. So what can SLPs do? We can educate our patients and their caregivers around diet recommendations and compensatory strategies. This could include things like providing a list of acidic foods and drinks with alternatives the patient could consume instead, timing meals several hours before bed, eating smaller portions throughout the day instead of three large portions, and even consulting with GI or an ENT if more serious concerns are observed. A friend of mine shared a story about her mom who was experiencing progressive difficulty with swallowing. She also noticed more mucus production and increased coughing at night. The symptoms got so bad that her mom could only take small sips of water and take tiny bites of soft foods. She started to lose weight as she was becoming increasingly anxious around food and her fear of choking took over. She told her mom to see an ENT so she could get scoped. The ENT saw significant redness throughout the entire throat and a lot of inflammation and mucus. He told her that these were classic symptoms of severe GERD. He recommended some over-the-counter medication, and sure enough, within a week, her symptoms started to disappear. By week two, she was completely asymptomatic and was finally putting some weight back on. My friend gave her mom several handouts on ways to prevent reflux, and so far this incident has never happened again. Her mom had no idea that reflux could lead to such severe dysphagia symptoms. Structural Disorders while GERD is a motility disorder SLPs might encounter often, there are several structural disorders that could also show up on your radar as an SLP. A diverticulum. A diverticulum is a pouch that can develop inside of the esophagus and collect food and liquids. This can lead to symptoms of dysphagia, a lump sensation in the throat, chronic coughing, or even regurgitation. An SLP might be the first person to catch an esophageal diverticulum during a video fluoroscopy. SLPs can make the appropriate referral for the patient to discuss potential surgical treatment options and can suggest possible compensatory strategies as tested under fluoroscopy when it comes to diverticuli. A cricopharyngeal bar. A cricopharyngeal bar, also known as a CP bar, is a prominent cricopharyngeal muscle. Some people describe it as looking like a thumb sticking into the upper esophagus when a CP bar is observed during a video fluoroscopy. Potential causes of a CP bar include chronic reflux causing hypertrophy of the muscle or fibrosis, achalasia, cricopharyngeal muscle spasms, or it could be idiopathic where it's just a normal variant. GERD is a particularly common cause of CP bars, with up to 50% of documented GERD cases having an associated CP bar. While there are no specific dysphagia exercises that can shrink or fix the CP bar, SLPs can consider certain exercises that target improved relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter. 
Sometimes a CP bar can result in reduced UES opening and or esophageal stasis surrounding the esophageal prominence. And some patients may complain of increased difficulty with solids. Combining compensatory strategies and considering certain exercises to improve UES relaxation could reduce the need for surgical intervention for some patients. As with everything we do, this is on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no one strategy that will work for everyone. Tracheoesophageal fistula, or TE fistula, is a connection between the esophagus and trachea through an opening or a hole. As we all know, the trachea and esophagus are separate structures and should not be communicating with each other. However, the esophagus is directly behind the trachea, and sometimes a small opening or channel can be created due to things like injury, trauma, prolonged mechanical ventilation, or excessive cuff pressure from endotracheal tubes in patients who rely on a ventilator. A tracheoesophageal fistula can result in food particles or liquids leaking from the esophagus into the trachea and lungs. This is a condition that requires medical intervention. SLPs can sometimes be the first to catch a TE fistula during a video fluoroscopy, An appropriate interprofessional recommendation should be made. A colleague shared a story with me about a patient who had a total laryngectomy and a tracheoesophageal prosthesis, which is a small speaking valve that is inserted in the tracheoesophageal wall so patients without a larynx can redirect the air from the trachea into their esophagus to create what's known as esophageal speech. He came in for pneumonia, and the team was concerned that it was aspiration pneumonia. My colleague did a clinical swallow evaluation, and for the first time ever, felt like she had x-ray vision because she could shine a flashlight right into the patient's stomach and see if any food or liquid entered the trachea. She was keeping her eye on the TEP. Sure enough, she saw applesauce leak through the TEP, which should not be happening. This is exactly what you might see with the tracheoesophageal fistula, which is something that can be caught on a video fluoroscopy. Because of this structural change, she was able to consult with the patient's ENT and they were able to set him up with an appointment to get this repaired immediately. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't wanna miss, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, do you have any specific questions about these esophageal conditions? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. Number three, UES dysfunction. Another common esophageal condition SLPs might encounter is upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction or UES dysfunction. At rest, when we're breathing and speaking, our UES is closed tight. We don't want air to get into our esophagus and we don't want food, liquids, or gastric content coming up out of our esophagus. Whenever we swallow, however, the UES relaxes and opens up. It should open up to allow food and liquid to pass into the esophagus without difficulty. Sometimes, however, the UES won't relax and open all the way, resulting in a narrow opening of the UES, which causes food or liquid to remain in the pharynx, sometimes even aspirating into the lung. Some cases are so severe that the UES doesn't open at all, resulting in an inability to eat or drink anything by mouth. So what are some causes of impaired UES relaxation and what can SLPs do about it? Neurologic, such as brainstem infarct or tumors. One potential cause of UES dysfunction to consider is a brainstem infarct or some other form of brainstem disruption, like a tumor. There are three sets of brainstem nuclei that control oral, pharyngeal, and esophageal phases of swallowing. The nucleus ambiguous and dorsal motor nucleus house the motor neurons of the pharyngeal and esophageal phases of swallowing. That's Lang 2009. If there's an impedance or disruption of these nuclei, it's common to see a sudden onset of pharyngeal dysphagia and impaired, sometimes absent, UES relaxation and opening. SLPs can sometimes be the first to catch a brainstem etiology as sometimes difficulty swallowing can be the only symptom. Some SLPs will even describe the characteristics of this type of dysphagia as a very neuro looking swallow. After you see several of these under video fluoroscopy, it might become easier to recognize the red flags of brainstem related dysphagia. In a lot of cases, alternative means of nutrition is recommended while the SLP provides intensive dysphagia therapy and we allow neuroplasticity to do its work. SLPs can work on dysphagia exercises that target UES opening. The McNeil Dysphagia Therapy Program, or MDTP, is another program that has been proven beneficial to this population. However, you do need to be a certified MDTP provider in order to implement this program. 
One paper published in Dysphagia in 2015 looked at integrating isometric and isokinetic exercises with neuromuscular electrical stimulation and MDTP for patients with brainstem stroke. The results were promising. However, it should be noted that only three patients were included in this study. Reduced hyolaryngeal mechanics. The UES relaxes and opens by the forward movement of the larynx with the contraction of the hyoid muscles, as well as a variety of other reflexes. If the hyolaryngeal muscle movement is reduced or unable to lift and open the UES, then food will have a hard time passing through the UES and into the esophagus. Strokes can cause this type of impairment. Reduced hyolaryngeal elevation and anterior hyoid movement can't be identified at bedside. It must be visualized under video fluoroscopy. SLPs can target these muscles with specific dysphagia exercises and programs, including neuromuscular electrical stimulation. A colleague of mine shared a story about a patient she was working with in the hospital who was originally admitted because of a type of chemotoxicity. This patient had ovarian cancer and was nearing the end of her chemotherapy rounds. The medical team originally consulted speech therapy because they wanted to make sure she was safe to eat and drink, especially since her immune system was compromised. The patient didn't demonstrate any signs or symptoms of dysphagia, had no complaints of dysphagia, and didn't have any active or recent pneumonias. Her overall medical status had actually improved by the time my colleague was able to see her and the team was hoping to discharge her soon. About 24 hours after my colleague completed her assessment, she was paged to do another dysphagia evaluation. The patient suddenly couldn't swallow. When my colleague saw her at bedside, she noticed the patient was holding a suctioning device up to her mouth because she couldn't even swallow her own saliva. This was such a sudden and dramatic change from the initial evaluation. Because this was the patient's only symptom and it was sudden, my colleague spoke with the medical team and suggested a neuro consult with possible brain MRI. Unfortunately, the team discovered a tumor on the patient's medulla, metastatic cancer. The patient ultimately decided to pursue comfort care. If you'd like to dive into some more detailed resources, webinars for ASHA CEUs, and a thriving community to grow your knowledge around dysphagia and esophageal diseases, I invite you to check out the MedSLP Collective. We have a robust and vibrant community of SLPs and mentors to help you out with your toughest clinical cases. Head over to metaslpcollective.com now to get your hands on this. The link will be in the description below.